The setting for Matthew 4, 19 through 22 is the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus chose his first disciples, four fishermen, two sets of brothers. Let us hear the word of God. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were repairing their nets, and he called to them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was growing up in Appalachia, my daddy, i never forget this, when I was just a tiny kid, and I, I was the, the runt of the litter in the Green family, just a little guy, and, and I'll never forget this. Dad, especially at the funeral home, most of you realize dad was an undertaker, and when, when the front office would be full, he'd come over and and uh, he'd be sitting at his chair, rather, and he'd have me move over and pat his knee, and I'd sit on his knee. And he'd say, Joe, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, and, and that, was, uh, that was a cue for me to say, I want to be an undertaker, Dad. <laughs> and uh, it didn't work out that way, although I have three brothers and two nephews and one great-nephew that are undertakers. But uh, um, so if you need a pre-need, see me after church. <laughs> um, but anyway, that, that was just kind of a, you know, that, that was supposed to be our response. Uh, down deep, you know, I wanted to say, I want to be an astronaut. Uh, I, I, I want to be president, goodness gracious. Or I want to play professional football. You know, I, I wanted to say something something big like that. Uh, do you ever have that, those, those kind of dreams when you, when you were a kid? Uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, uh, when you get older and you look back on your life, the question is, have I lived my life well? Have I done the things and been the person that God has called me or created me to be? Because really, everybody here, we're all different, but we're all wired for greatness. And, and I'll be sharing a series on that probably this year. I'm working on it right now, on how we are wired. But uh, that's another story. But, but anyway, we are wired for greatness. And, and greatness in God's eyes is not about your portfolio or a house or car that you might drive or, or any of that. It, it goes a little deeper than that, you know? It's about, uh, a lot of us feel that, that when we think about death or going deep with God, we think about our journey to finding God. But, but really, it's not about the journey. Deep is not about the journey in our search for God. Deep, deep is about the place where we have found him. Deep. Is about being in his presence. Uh, not too many years ago, I was sitting in the office at a church I was serving, and um, one of the most successful businessmen in the Knoxville area, and, and I was told recently, uh, is known as one of the most successful businessmen in the Southeast, was sitting in my office. And uh, he said, Joe, I have everything. I said, well, that, that's nice. Most of us know that. Uh, how about sharing a little bit? I happen to have an offering plate right here. Um, he said, I've got everything. And, and he, he mentioned a few things that he had, a few toys that he owned. And I said, well, that's nice, you know. And uh, uh, he went on and on. And he said, how come I'm not happy? How come I'm not fulfilled? I said, well, brother... God didn't create your sports cars to bring you fulfillment. If you think that, you've been lied to. And we talked a little bit, 
And then I began to point him in the direction of the Savior, and, and it, it's, been, it's a long story uh, that's an awesome, incredible thing that God did in his life and, and continues to do through his life. But he had no fulfillment. It's like that quote, and, and by the way, if you're, if you're visiting here because you're not having church at your place, uh, welcome. You'll find a copy of the outline of the message in your bulletin. And I want to point that out to you, okay? That you'll note there that a quote I have by that great uh, theologian, Ted Turner. <laughs> well, maybe Ted, Ted's not a theologian. I don't think from what I've heard is close to that. But he did say this, and, and it, it merits our reading, I think. Ted Turner, head of CNN at one time, and, and really the founder of Cable News Network, but that's another story. He said, life is like a B-grade movie. You don't want to leave in the middle of it, but you don't want to see it again either. And a lot of, you ever feel like that? That maybe this week uh, out in the driveway while you're shoveling all that time, that, that you felt like that. But um, um, life is like a B-grade movie. Now what I want to talk about, I, I want us to look, and, 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 and you heard uh, Chris Reed, and by the way, I, I got an email from Chris this week, and we were talking about the service, and, and I, I didn't realize who the liturgist was, and it just said Chris and Jim, and uh, I, I just saw the Jim part, and so, hey brother, <laughs> <laughs> am I going off and on up here? Uh, that's for the effect that, that we're trying to produce. <laughs> It's just part of what we're trying to make happen here. Um, but she shared, she read uh, about the disciples. And an incredible story about the disciples. That they were out doing their thing. Doing what fishermen do one day. And the one who, who would change their lives just walked up. And he said, and, and a couple of things there, he says, he said, follow me. And, and a couple of places, in one it said, immediately they left. I like that. I, at once they left. They left all they had ever known. They left. And you say, well, that wouldn't have been hard. Uh, the obscurity of, of living a life as a fisherman at some forgotten lake. I mean, who would know about them? What, they, what were they giving up? But imagine that. They were just ordinary people. My brother David uh, used to work at Captain D's in Norton when he was in high school. And when he would come in the house after working at Captain D's, we all knew he was home. <laughs> you know? He, he smelled like a number one with a Diet Coke. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that, that it, you, you just knew he was there. And, and that's, it, well, that's the way it was with these fishermen. And one day Jesus came and said, I'm going to change life for you altogether. Follow me. Follow me. And, and, and they followed him. And then, and then, look again on the outline, they learned along the way. Now, I followed Jesus. I, I was brought up in a home, and, and, and Mary Ruth Richards, who, who used to be our conference lay leader, and her husband Phil are here from Ketron. Great to have you guys. Great to have you. I grew up with Mary Ruth. She's a lot older than I am, but I grew up with Mary Ruth. And I went to college with Phil. We're both just kids. Uh, so we're glad to have you all today. But uh, growing up in Appalachia, I followed Jesus. And I was like, like Mary Ruth's family. We went to church whether we wanted to or not. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we were there. We were there. They said, well, the Greens and the Blakemores are here. It's time to do church. I mean, that's, that's the way it was. We were there. <laughs> and for years, I followed Jesus from a distance. I did. I followed Jesus. I saw all of his movies. Back then, the greatest story ever told, being her, I saw them all. I said, Jesus, when I'd pray, I said, remember me? I was, I was sitting midway back on the left in the theater. I saw your movie. You know, I saw all of his movies. I followed him from a distance. And they began to follow Jesus, these disciples. And they learned along the way, which is pretty cool, I thought. Uh, because, I think, because as they learned, as they learned about Jesus, you know, people began to see that these guys were always kind of with Jesus. And so they, they, there were such crowds that couldn't get to Jesus, so they'd go to the disciples. I'm sure it happened like this. 
And, and they'd go to the disciples, and, and they'd say, uh, what's he talking about when he says, uh, love your neighbors yourself, or love those that hate you, or, or turn the cheek when somebody hits you. Well, what's he talking about? And, and as they learned, they became teachers. I'm, I'm sure this happened. Think about it. That, that as they learned more and walked more with Jesus, and they were brought out of the obscurity of, 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 of being fishermen, they would become teachers themselves because they just simply taught what they learned. Look at the scripture. In Matthew 4, Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching everywhere the good news about the kingdom. And it goes on, says, news about him spread uh, far beyond the borders of Galilee. Large crowds followed him wherever. And uh, they experienced, they also experienced exciting times. Can you imagine being one of Jesus' guys? I mean, think about that. You've got thousands of people out there, and, and, and Jesus said, Joe, you're in charge of organizing the crowd when you pray for the sick. I said, nothing to it. So, so we put all the lepers over here and, and kind of away from the people because they weren't supposed to be close anyway. And then, and then maybe we move a little section over here for the crippled people. And then the blind, you had to show them because you just say, everybody over here, they couldn't see. Bring them over here. Bring them over here. And then over here, now think about this, think about this. We're Methodists, and it had to be this way. We believe this from the bottom of our heart, that we had the lepers, we had the crippled, we had the blind, we had those who were just sick with, with cancer-like disease, and we had a place for the people to bring casseroles because they were Methodists. I mean, not everybody's sick, and you know this happened. Isn't that right? Remember the little boy that had the food? We're not sure what that food was like. I don't, I don't Sounds like it's about like a happy meal, but I believe it was a casserole of some kind. And, and his mama, probably Ruth, sent this casserole. So they're over there, and we, we organize this thing. Stand there and be a part of this and watch this happen. That, that there they are, at the lepers, and, and they're, they're, they're all, oh, they're a mess, and, and their bodies are distorted. And, and they're, they're, you know, they, they have to say, Back, back, a leper, a leper. And, and you couldn't even get close. And Jesus walks over and touches them. And you're standing there, one of the disciples, and your mouth drops as you see the, the, the scab, the scales, and fall off of their bodies. And, and, and they're, they're healed. And then you get over here to the cripple, and, and you hear the bones snapping together as they stand up. And they, they can't even walk right. You know, it's like a, uh, like a newborn uh, pony that, 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 you know, that, that kind of have a strange gait. They're kicking those legs up, and these guys hadn't walked in years, and, and they're walking differently, and you're standing there trying to be cool and saying, ah, it happens every day, you know. But, but you're there, and you're, you're saying, wow, this is incredible. And the blind, and, and, and maybe you've seen some of the blind. Maybe they're your friends, and, and there they are, and Jesus touches them, and, and the lights come on. And life will never be the same for them. They don't have to beg anymore because they've got sight. They've got new possibilities. They've got, they've got sight and insight. They've been touched by Jesus. And then here, this, the one at the point of death almost, and Jesus raises them up, and you're there. And then what do you do at the end? Fellowship supper, of course. And there's a casserole, and you're over there. But anyway, it's exciting to walk with Jesus. You believe that? Wow. And then, look again at your outline. They experienced difficult, difficult times. In Matthew 8, they were out on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus and the disciples. And a storm comes up. Jesus is asleep. And the, disi the disciples who were fishermen were frightened out of their mind. This is a horrible storm and the waves are coming over in the boat. And they wake up, Jesus, Jesus, don't you care? We're about to die. We're about to perish. Now, isn't that a ridiculous statement? The Father, Father God, sends the Son, His only begotten Son to earth, to drown in a boating accident on the Sea of Galilee. That, instead of a cross, we'd be wearing a boat of some kind. Now, I mean, think about that. They, but Jesus is at peace, and He stands in the midst of the storm, and, and the waves are, and He says, Peace be still. Now, these guys have seen everything, but suddenly it's, it's the smoothest carpet. And they say, who is this guy? Who is this guy? And before you know it, they're ashore. 
And they get off the boat, and instead of a welcome wagon like they'd have in Kingsport, Tennessee, they had two demoniacs. A couple of guys that were possessed by demons come up, and they're cursing, and they scream out to Jesus. They say, depart from us, Jesus. We know who you are. We know who you are. And, and then they uh, command us to go into those pigs. And, and there's, there's a bunch of pigs here. And, and Jesus said, okay. And they go into the pigs. As someone said one time, they told me, said, the first time we ever saw a deviled ham. But they went into the pigs. <laughs> they went into the pigs. And the pigs ran into the, ran into the water and drowned. And, and, and the people were just frightened in this town. Instead of being excited about Jesus, they're frightened. And they don't know what to do. And, and finally they look to Jesus and say, you need to leave. You need to leave. You can read about this in Matthew 8. And then in Matthew 9, Jesus is walking and he sees Matthew, the one who would record this. And he says, follow me. Matthew was a tax collector. You don't want a tax collector following you. He said, follow me. And they ended up at Matthew's house and they're eating. And then Jesus had his biggest problem at all. If you read the Bible, in the Gospels, who did he have the most trouble with? Religious folks. The Pharisees got all upset. And they challenged him. There were times of danger. There were times when it was difficult. And then finally you see there that they obeyed his instructions. You see that? Jesus called 12 of his followers and sent them into the right fields. He gave them power to kick out the evil spirits and to tenderly care for bruised and hurt lives. Jesus sent his 12 harvest hands out, out with this charge. He said, go to the lost. Tell them about the kingdom is here. Uh, bring health to the sick. Touch the untouchables. You have been treated generously, so live generously. And a life well lived, they served, didn't they? And then it says that they were rewarded. Wow, they were rewarded. This is a large work I've called you into, but don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small, he says. And if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of these followers, you will surely be rewarded. Wow. I, I've kind of learned what a life well lived is all about and I'll share these points with you as we close just considering these things that we've read now, now how do we how do we begin to go after it as I say the first thing we replace convenience with obedience in America we love convenience I, I remember when you would go into a grocery store but well, we go into Thomas Grocery, Granny Thomas, there in the old bottom of Appalachia, and, and we go in there, and we might get some potato chips. And then things got complex because they developed corn chips. Frito-Lay came out with corn chips, but they knew we were unable to handle corn chips when it came to bean dip. So then they come out with a, with a, with a scoop. And the scoop was was at the level of Super Bowl. You know, that Super Bowl is at that level that, we, that came out with scoop because they knew that it'd keep us from getting it all over us and, and, and it would solve arguments in the house and keep families together, the scoop, <laughs> the scoop because of convenience. Isn't that weird? And, and everything's got to be convenient. You know, even church services, what's convenient? What's convenient? You know how? How's this thing work? We're not people. Uh, at, at about the fifth or sixth station on the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem, and the Via Dolorosa uh, is believed to be the, the path, if you will, or the street where Jesus would carry the cross to Calvary. And if you've ever been there, when you walk down the Via Dolorosa, there are stations that you can stop at. And, and they might say, well, this is, this is where he... He stumbled and he fell. You know, this is where Simon the Cyrene came and took the cross. But it was at the fifth or sixth station, there was a lady who ran a little shop there. Her name was Frida Hannah. And Frida sold embroidery and stuff like that, souvenirs. And one day in her little shop, she had a bunch of tourists, and um, they were looking at all that she had. 
and there was a bunch of Palestinian beggars in there. And finally, one of the tourists, one of the tourists turned to Frida and said, get these beggars out of here. To which she turned to a friend standing beside her and said, that's one of those people who take the Bible literally, but not seriously. That we can say we believe the word, and yet we don't believe it to the level where it interferes with the convenience of our living or our lifestyle. You with me? Still glad you came this morning? Go buy those scoops, Super Bowl coming up, right? So look at obedience. So look at these scriptures I have for you there. I just, I'll just read them quickly. Jesus said, more blessed, but even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Someone told me one time, said, it's hard to understand the Bible. And then someone else told me one time, said, if you want to understand the Bible, do the Bible. It's a lot easier to understand if you're walking it out and you're living it. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments, John 14. 1 John 5, loving God means keeping his commandments, and really this isn't difficult. Romans 2, merely hearing God's law is a waste of your time. If you don't do what he commands, doing, not hearing, is what makes the difference with God. You want a life well lived? Replace convenience with obedience. And then secondly, put yourself in scary situations. And I, I make reference here to a scripture, and I, I, I'll not read it again, but in, in Matthew 10, where he says, Go to the lost, bring health to the sick, touch the untouchables. Think about that. I had a lady in a, a church that Beth and I were serving, and uh, she and I, we knocked heads all the time. <laughs> Goodness gracious, until we started serving together. We became best friends. But I will never forget, I will never forget the time of going to, see, going to visit a man who was about this tall and weighed about 90 pounds wet. You know, I mean, he was a, he was a little guy and we called him Brute. And Brute was about 95, 96, or 7. And Betty and I, the lady, we went to his house to serve communion one day. And she was a manicurist and a pedicurist. And the Brute was there. And when we walked in, as she did uh, every month, she knelt before Brute. And she, uh, she washed his feet. She knelt before him. And she washed his feet, and then she gave him a pedicure. And, and I was sitting there that day, and it's the first time I'd seen her do that as she was kneeling before this old man. And uh, he was talking nonstop and just so thankful and glad to see us. And, and she's kneeling before him, and she's giving him a pedicure. And I'm sitting there trying to talk with Brute and keep my thoughts straight because I was overwhelmed by what I was seeing. I looked at that, and it was like I was looking at Jesus, just humbling himself and washing the feet of this man. And, and I was trying to hold back tears. I was overwhelmed. And when I got outside with Betty, and we sat down in the car, and, she's, and I looked at her, and I said, that's the most awesome thing I've seen in years. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, you're cutting the toenails. A brute. She said, well, Joe, he needed a pedicure. I said, but that, his walking was such a struggle anyway, and there you are caring for this man. I said, I could almost hear divine applause. I, I said, I believe that, that's the thing, that's the thing that brings a smile on the face of Jesus. I said, she cared for him. It also brought great healing to this day, to our relationship. And then the third thing I put here, and I close with this, believe you can make a difference. If you want your life to, to mean something, to really, you know, it's one thing about living a productive life, or, or productive in the eyes of the world, 
But it might be another thing to live a significant life in the eyes of God. You with me? Believe you can make a difference. Jesus said, you don't need a lot of equipment. I love this in the message. You don't need a lot of equipment. You are the equipment. Wow. Isn't that awesome? That the disciples understood that, that though they were just fishermen, and they were not so much educated in, in the religious world or all of that, God's hand was on them to go and make a difference. So many of you people have made a difference in different places all over this world because of guys like Danny Howe, you know, Susie Peterson, people that, that basically gave the call of God to you and gave you opportunity to go anywhere and everywhere, whether across the world or across the street. You heard the call, and it's a high call. Years ago, years ago, uh, Stephen Jobs, you remember he was head of Apple Computer, and, and Stephen Jobs uh, lost that job, I think it was in the 90s maybe, and, and then he would be picked up again and, and, and until he died. But there was a time when they were looking for a leader to lead Apple Computer which is an incredible company. And, and they were looking everywhere, and Stephen Jobs had his eye on one man, John Scully. John Scully was a very successful leader of um, um, PepsiCo. PepsiCo is Pepsi-Cola, with all of its conglomerate of restaurants, like at that time they owned Pizza Hut, they owned, I think they owned uh, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and... and other places like that. It, it was a big conglomerate, and John Scully led that company and led it to new heights, and, and Stephen Jobs thought he could do that for Apple Computer. So he wined him and he dined him, and finally, after months and months of the consideration, they're in a restaurant, and John Scully said to Stephen Jobs, he said, Stephen, I can't be the head of Apple Computer. I don't know a thing about computers. He said, I've been in food service for the last 30 or 40 years. That's all I know. To which St Stephen Jobs rose up, rose up in his chair, I'm told, and leaned over the table and looked at John Scully and said, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water or do you want a chance to change the world? That's the same kind of offer that God makes to us. That's how far, that's, that's how far beyond where he wants us to be. He says, do you want to sell sugared water or do you want a chance to change the world? Because whatever your profession, you can raise it to that level if it's a walk of obedience, not convenience. If it's really here, of God and doing what he's called you to do. You with me? Hello? You there? Let's pray. Father, what an awesome, awesome thing you did with, with a bunch of fishermen, goodness gracious, and with a few others. Turn the world upside down. And Lord, I know that the things that we talk about in this room, in this sanctuary, are strange to uh, a great uh, section of the world, but we know your ways are not always man's ways. That your calling is higher, that whether we be a, a teacher or, or a business person or whatever our calling in life, when we walk in, in step with you in that majestic cadence that, that you walk before us, you bring a new level to whatever we're involved in. That's not about convenience, it's about obedience. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, that we not accept a lifestyle that brings no fulfillment. It may provide toys, but like my buddy years ago, you changed directions when, when he turned away from just buying toys and to being a part of a life-changing ministry. It changed him forever. 
Put that kind of desire and drive in our hearts. And may we be bold to be your people at whatever station to be your people, Lord, and to fulfill the call you have upon our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.